Will you pray with me, please? Holy and amazing God, once more we say thank you for this beautiful day you have given us, allowing each and every one of us to rise this morning, come into this holy place, to be in your presence and to be in the presence of one another. We ask now that you bless us once more with your word, speaking into our hearts. And therefore I ask that any words that pass from my mouth and all the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you. In Christ's name we ask for this in all things. Amen. 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 Well, who here remembers Patti LaBelle? <laughs> Good. She was, uh, well, I guess a disco singer, a wonderful singer from the, what, uh, 90s, 80s, <laughs> 70s? <laughs> we won't go any further back than that. But, you know, she also sang a lot of gospel music. And she sang a song called Ready for a Miracle. And it started off, are you ready for a miracle? Ready as I can be. Are you ready for a miracle? Spirit set me free. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Miracles. And whether we, allow, we will allow the Spirit of God to set us free, whether we're ready or not. I think when we hear the word miracle, we often think of only one thing. That miracles only happened way back in biblical times. When God seemed to have to prove something to people. And the way to do it was through miracles. We have two such miracle stories this morning that seem to marry each other very closely. But while we keep reading these miracle, about these miracle stories, it's good not to just keep them in the past. Just read them in the book and close it. And think, oh, that was just something that happened way in the past. 2,000 years ago, in the case of Jesus raising the young man from the dead. And 3,000 years ago, in the case of Elijah doing the same. For the problem with keeping these stories rooted only in the past is that they're just good stories. What are we supposed to do with them today is the question. We have two stories of young people dying and being brought back to life and given back to their mothers. But millions, billions, of people have died since then. Why haven't their grieving mothers been given back their children? Why only this widow of Zarephath and this widow of Nain? Well, before we answer that question, let's define what a miracle actually is. One dictionary offered the following two definitions. One, a miracle is a surprising and welcome event that is not explicable by natural or scientific laws and is therefore considered to be the work of divine agency. Second definition, a highly improbable or extraordinary event that brings very welcome consequences. Note the similarities here. Both talk about a surprising and extraordinary event that brings very welcome consequences. The only difference in those two definitions is whether the event is attributed to pure chance or divine agency. So let's go back and look at our two miracle stories this morning. In the case of the prophet Elijah, it starts off saying there's a, a widow that's standing at the gate to a town called Zarephath. She's out there because she's looking for some firewood, a couple of sticks to build a fire. Earlier in the story, we had learned that a drought has come to the land and it's affecting everything. All the wells are dry, the crops are failed, there's nothing left to eat or drink. 
and her life now seems to be as dry and parched as the land. No food, no water, no future. So she decides that she'll go find a few sticks to build a fire with. She only has a little bit of oil, a little bit of flour left, so she'll bake one last small cake of bread that she and her son will eat and then die. The second story, we have another widow. This one's walking with a whole crowd of people toward the gate at the town called Nain. It's a funeral procession for her son, her only son. He's already died. And now she is alone and on her own. And whether that is in first century Palestine or today, that is a risky place to be. These stories, these miracle stories about dead people being given new life are indeed meant to highlight the power of God over all things, including life, death, and natural law. But notice something in them. These stories don't actually center upon the ones being brought back from the dead. They center on the people who had originally experienced loss and through God have now been given their own new lease on life. They are about life and the God who meets us in our struggles of our daily existence. And that is what makes these stories as real today as the day they happened. People live these stories every day. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking with a woman and she was talking about the death of her child. And she said that she often fantasized and asked God that her son might be given back to her. And who can blame her? She only wants what the widow of Nain got. She wants the life she used to have. That sense of meaning and belonging and relationship that used to be. She wants to be told, do not weep. She wants her son and her own life to be given back to her. She only wants what the widow of Zarephath got. Who can blame her? She wants the emptiness, the hunger, the famine of her life to go away. She wants to know that there will be enough food for her family to eat without worry or hunger She wants once more the abundance and fullness of life. Like the widows of Nain and Zarephath, she's standing at the gate, that place of change and transition, the place where people and life come and go. So she's really no different from us. The circumstances may be different, but like her, we too have stood at the gate watching life change, people coming and going. Sometimes it is the death of a loved one or the end of a relationship. Other times it's the loss of a dream, our health, financial security, the end of a career, Whenever we seem to have lost our way, our faith, our meaning, our identity, our enthusiasm for life, we find ourselves standing still, looking out, wondering what it would be like, if only. If only we could take back those words that were spoken in anger or fear. If only we would have spoken rather words of love and beauty and thankfulness and gratitude. If only we had made different choices in life. If only we could redo our marriages, our relationships, our loves. 
If only we could go back and maybe reorder our priorities. And if only we could have been given back to us the people and parts of our lives that have died. Well, some will say that those are only daydreams, things to think about, but no smart person would really build a future upon. Well, I say they are not daydreams. They are the basis for a real and lasting relationship with the one who can make things new, with the one who can still make miracles happen right here today and not just 3,000 years ago. Well, no, we can't take back words that are already spoken in fear or anger, but we can try to find the courage to make amends for those words. And we can choose to going going forward only use words that are grounded in love and understanding and compassion and thankfulness. Believe me, if you've ever done that, you know what a miracle that is, right? Imagine if everyone started doing that. That would be a miracle. Something unexpected and extraordinary. And the same holds true for our relationships. Now, it is true that some relationships have been broken so badly that they're probably going to stay that way. And it's probably best they stay that way so no more harm is done. But that does not mean that we have to base our entire understanding of all future relationships on that one broken one. I mean, give yourself some grace. As Paul would say, don't live in the sin of the past, but into the future of God's grace. I mean, if God is willing to forgive and still meet you every single day, why should you think it's okay for you to hold on what God has already let go of? I think that would be the biggest miracle of all. If we could let go of all the things we hang on to. All the things we know are bad for us, but we keep doing anyway. All the thoughts we keep in our heads. And not just the thoughts about others, but the ones we keep about ourselves as well. If we could somehow let go of the things that deplete our lives and and be open to the things that fill our lives, don't you think that would be a surprising and extraordinary event that brings welcome consequences? So let me ask again. Are you ready for a miracle? (laughs) Do you want more in your life? In the life of your loved ones? In the life of the world? Yes. Yes. (laughs) Then don't give up praying for miracles. But you have to remember, they are surprising and extraordinary events. Meaning, you cannot expect a miracle if your prayer to God goes like this. Lord, raise my son from the dead, and then I will have faith in you. But I bet you can't expect a miracle if you pray, Lord, give me faith in the presence of my despair. So that we all may pray like the great Patti LaBelle and say, Blessed be the ones who mourn, for they shall find their peace Blessed be the ones who thirst, and blessed be the meek. Blessed be the innocent, for they shall all be free. Blessed be the miracle that's made for you and me. And if you agree with that, can I get one more amen? Amen. Amen. (laughs) Amen. Will you pray with me, please? Holy God, hear us as we pray. For all who thirst in the world, for those who live in real places of drought, for those who live with no clean water. We pray for those who are hungry, for those who are struggling to find good employment, struggling to afford to put food on the table. 
We pray for those who are struggling because they are widows or widowers. For families who are bereaved, having experienced the death of someone important to them, whom they loved and still love. We pray for those who are ill in mind and body or spirit, that you would breathe new life into them here on earth or in your heaven. And now in silence, dear Lord, we lift those people held close in our hearts who need your healing spirit. May we marvel at the miracles you perform for us each and every day. In the name of Christ, amen.